Okay, thank you for coming. It's good to see all your faces here. Um, as Matt said, this is systematic theology. This will be the second class. Pastor Keith did the uh, first class last month on a case for theology, and he um, did a good job of explaining just why we need to do systematic theology, why um, we, we don't just say the Bible is our creed or Jesus is our creed. Um, because it's not that simple. When, when you study the scriptures, um, you, you, you can see that there, there's a system of truth in scripture. Um, and I remember uh, reading Spurgeon. He, he commented, he said that um, theology is to the Bible what science is to the earth. Okay, So um, that's, that's a nice way of putting it together. So, so we... we we have to systematize um, the different things. We have to put them together. We have to take all of Scripture and begin to formulate the doctrines. And that's and and so now we're going to dive into it. Now we're going to get into the first topic, which is man's chief end. Um, now, <clears throat> this this is coming from the Westminster Confession, which this church, St. John's, we we, we adhere to um, the Westminster Confession of Faith and the Belgian Confession, both of those historic confessions of faith. Um, St. John's um, ha has as their part of their doctrinal uh, statement. So the title to this lecture is, uh, is, is Man's Chief End. Now, I borrowed the majority of my material from Thomas Watson's A Body of Divinity. Now, Watson was an English Puritan during the 17th century, and he was instrumental in constructing the Westminster Standards in an attempt to unify the theology of the Church of England, the Church of Ireland, and the Church of Scotland. And although it took many years to accomplish this task, it was uh, to, to formulate the Westminster Standards, there was, I think, somewhere like around 120 different men, mostly pastors, but also theologians. Um, it was disrupted by civil war, but, but the end result after they finally came back was magnificent. They, they formulated the Westminster Standards, which was the Confession of Faith, uh, the Larger and Shorter Catechism, and uh, um, the Directory of Church uh, Worship. Now, it can, it can rightly be said that, that the Confession and, and the catechisms were pastoral theology. Um, they, they were pastoral the theology and they were pastoral wisdom for the benefit of the church. These men wanted to make a sound and robust theology. But they also had an eye to practicality. They weren't making a textbook just for seminary students. They were making it for lay people. They were making it for the church. And in the words of R.C. Sproul, the Westminster Confession is the most precise and accurate summary of the content of biblical Christianity ever set forth in creedal form. No historic confession surpasses in eloquence, grandeur, and theological accuracy the Westminster Confession of Faith. Now that's quite an acknowledgement from Sproul. Now keep in mind that was written in 1674. That's 374 years ago. And Sproul, who just passed away in 2017, said that there hasn't been a greater summary of the Christian faith in creedal form. I think we need to pay attention to these guys, and I think it would be safe to say that the, all the teachers here in the Bible Institute would agree with me that most of the best theology books and writings were written by men who are now dead. I'm not saying that there aren't any good books today, right? Of course there are, but I think the best ones were, were written by men who are dead. And that's why I want to, I, I'm drawing the majority of my information from Watson's Body of Divinity. I mean, if you pick that up and start reading through it, you'll understand why. It's not just some ivory tower theology that only people who have PhDs can understand. It's super practical. He uses all kinds of ideas and illustrations to, to, to help the reader understands. So whether 
it's you're reading it or hearing it and preach to you, it, it would have been easy for anyone to understand. So Watson then, he takes the shorter catechism and he begins to preach it through to the congregation. In total, there was 176 sermons that he preached to the congregation. The first sermon, the chief end of man, comes directly from his first sermon on the catechism. So the first question in the catechism is stated thus, what is the chief end of man? The answer, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, you may be wondering, how can, how can someone spend so much time just on that question? How can you preach a whole sermon? Well, he was a Puritan, and that it was how the Puritans operated. They went deep into the word, right? Okay? Um, now, we aren't going to have time to examine the whole sermon, but I, just wanted, I, I do want to take some time and kind of do an overview. And we are going to go a little deep, so, you know, I, I mean, this is, the, this is a Bible Institute. We can go a little deep, right? You know, we, we're, we're here to learn, um, but, I, you know, I, I want to I be practical. I want to, you know, make, I, I, I want to speak and communicate these truths in a way that everyone can understand it, too, or else I'm not doing my job. So, the, the question, um, what, what is the chief end of man? That clearly states that man has an end. The question is not, does man have an end? No. That's not what we're here to discuss. This is not a progressive Bible Institute. This is a reformed Bible Institute, okay? Or evangelical in some ways. We are not ashamed to say here that we know the truth. <clears throat> now, when we speak about the chief end, we're not talking about the end of our lives. We're not talking about death. We're talking about a goal or a purpose for our lives. So here's a question. Does God have a right to tell us that he has an end for our lives. Does God have that right? Isn't that imposing? Doesn't that violate our free will? We love our independence. We, we love doing things ourselves, don't we? Don't tell me what to do, many say. Others say, I can't figure out to... I, I can figure out to do what, with my life all by myself. We know what that means, right? That's, that's atheism. Men don't need to be professed atheists to be atheists. If a man ignores God in this life, he is, for all intents and purposes, practicing atheism. Men don't like being told what to do, and they certainly don't like being told that someone else has a plan for their lives. They think, I'm the captain of my ship, I'm the master of my fate. Don't we hear that so often? They think that they are the captain of their ship, the master of their fate, but this kind of thinking is so far from the teaching of Scripture. This is nothing but a beastly pride, and it needs to come down. We might expect such thinking from, animal, from an animal. After all, animals don't have reason. They might expect such thinking. Uh, they, they don't have reasoning. They aren't conscious. So, I mean, we expect them to do, to act according to their instinct. But... But men are made in God's image and his likeness, and as such, should they not rise above the animal in their thinking and in their actions? The proud in heart and abomination to the Lord. Most people won't like to hear what I'm about to say, but the truth is I really can't get into the heart of my subject this evening without first knocking down an idol. What is the idol? It's a man-centered theology. And it's in far too many ch churches here in America. It's a theology that thinks that God exists to serve us. It's a theology that thinks that God exists to serve us and not the other way around. Man-centered theology teaches that God exists to love us and serve us and give us things. God exists, according to man-centered theology, to esteem us highly. That's a lie. Now, the view that I would present to you today is a God-centered theology. It teaches that God is the center, an object, and we exist to serve him and give him glory and honor and praise. He tells us what to do, 
not the other way around. As believers, we know that the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Is anything excluded from that? He owns it all. The Lord has made all things for himself. He has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. God has made us, and we must say together with the psalmist, Teach me your way, O Lord. I will walk in your truth. Unite my heart to fear your name. So far from being an imposition, it is right and good for God to give us a purpose, to give us an end for our lives, and one that involves both his glory and our enjoyment. So our concern for today is God's plan and purpose for his redeemed, which is much greater and higher than any purpose that man has apart from Christ. It is greater because its focus is on the infinite creator rather than the finite creation. We have a much higher end. We have the chief end because we have the highest and greatest object of worship, which is God himself. That great purpose... The end for which God created the world is his glory and our enjoyment forever. Now, what is meant by God's glory? When we hear the words God's glory, what comes to our minds? Do we think about something having to do with light or do we think about brightness? God's glory is much more than that. Let's first understand what is meant by God's glory. And then we will look at how it relates to man's chief end. Watson tells us that God's glory is twofold. Excuse me. It's intrinsic. The, the glory of God is twofold. It, he says it, there's the intrinsic glory of God and there is ascribed glory. Excuse me. What is intrinsic glory? It is the glory that relates to God alone. It is in God, inside him. It is part of who God is. Intrinsic glory is an essential part of God's nature. Without this glory, God would not be God. Okay? Now Watson illustrates it like this. He says that imagine a king wearing a golden crown, royal robes, decked out. He said if you take that away from the king, he's still a man. Now, regarding the glory of God, if you take the glory of God away from him, he's not God. That's how essential it, glory is to who God is. Listen to these verses describe the intrinsic glory of God. Psalm 104, 1 and 2. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Lord, my God, you are very great. You are clothed with splendor and majesty covering yourself with a light as with a cloak. 1 Timothy 6.16 Who alone possesses immortality and dwells in unapproachable light, whom no eye has seen or can see. Isn't that amazing? God can just put on light like a garment. His clothing is light. Who is, who's like that? Who can... Put on light like a piece of clothing. That's the intrinsic glory of God. Do you know anyone that lives in unapproachable light? This is who God is. This is what his glory is. But go ahead and search throughout all history and you won't find anyone that comes even, as, even close, glorious as men may be throughout history. There is no one like our God. But God's glory also has as much to do has much to do with the rest of his attributes. We also see God's intrinsic glory when we look at a statement like this from the scriptures. Romans eleven thirty three to 36 and you're probably familiar with this one too. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord that he should become his counselor? Or who has first given to him that it would be paid back to him. For from him and to him and through him are all things to him be the glory forever. Amen. 
The intrinsic glory of God is so great that we can't even wrap our minds around it. How unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. So, let me to explain it another way, and, and we'll move on to the next point, but God's, the, the intrinsic glory of God is like this. If we look outside and we see a beautiful red cardinal, we, we recognize it and we say, oh, look at that beautiful bird out there. But our recognizing and saying that that bird is beautiful does not make it more red. It doesn't make the bird bigger. It doesn't make it more glorious. It's just a recognition of it, okay? But it doesn't change anything about how the, the glory that that bird has. So we don't add glory to God when we, we add nothing to God's intrinsic glory, okay? And to, to, to end, to end uh, our discussion about the intrinsic glory of God, I'll just say that the reason we can't add to God's glory is because God is immutable. God, God doesn't change. When, when Moses met with God on, on, in Mount Sinai, he said to Moses, he said, tell them that I am has sent you. Okay? What does that mean? What does I am mean? Okay? Well, theologians say that what that means is that he's saying, I, I, I am what I am, not I will be what I will be. God doesn't, l listen, th this might sound weird, but God doesn't have potential to become greater than he already is. He's infinitely great and perfect. So he can't become greater than he already is. He's always as great and as powerful and as perfect as he, as he ever will be. We, we are in a stage of becoming, we, we are growing in, in physical and intellectual growth of, from one mature, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm tripping over myself. We move on from one stage of physical and intellectual growth and maturity to another, but God doesn't. Okay. He is perfectly glorious. Okay, so, the, so that's the intrinsic glory. Now, moving on to ascribed glory. The other side to God's glory is ascribed glory. The second part of what it means to glorify God is what Watson calls ascribed glory. Ascribed glory relates to our part. This is how we glorify God. We glorify God by ascribing glory to him. This is the work that the creature does in giving back to God what is due him. I love, what, I love how Watson puts this. Watson says, this is the yearly rent that we pay to the crown of heaven. Listen to Psalm 29, 1 and 2. Ascribe to the Lord, sons of the mighty. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. When we look up at the sky at night and we see a full moon, we say how beautiful, how marvelous that moon, that, that moon is that God created. And ascribing glory to the moon isn't making the moon more glorious than it already is, but it's an enjoyment of and a recognition of the glorious nature of the moon. It's, it's reflecting back to the glory or giving back the glory to its original source. So, so there, there, there just is... It might seem like we're, we're, we're splitting hairs here, but we're really not. Um, I don't know if you can see the difference there between intrinsic glory and ascribed glory, but um, we, are, we, are, when we, we don't have anything to do with God's intrinsic glory. That's who he is. But we, when we give glory to God, man's chief end is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. It's not making God more glorious, but glorifying him is reflecting back to him um, and, and giving him, like as Watson says, giving, giving him the rent that's due him. It's, it's recognizing that this is God's creation and saying, oh wow, look at this, look at the beautiful sunset. Look at how, look at all the colors, look at, you know, just pick something in God's creation. It, it's, it's giving him the credit for it. Okay? It's giving him the credit for it, all things. So, the next, the next point that Watson goes into is 
Uh, he says that glorifying God consists in four things. Um, and this is what it looks like when we glorify God. He says it consists in appreciation, adoration or worship, um, affection and subjection. So first there's appreciation. Now this means that we have a very high esteem of God in our minds. We say with the psalmist, for you are the most high over all the earth. You are exalted far above all gods. That's Psalm 97, 9. Although there are many things that may steal and indeed do steal away our attention at times from this fact, yet we know that God is above all things in our minds. Nothing could replace him in our minds. Our thoughts about him simply do not compare to anything that we think or imagine. Watson says that to glorify God is to have God admiring thoughts, to esteem him most excellent and search for diamonds in this rock. Next is adoration. This is our worship of God. We may think it a small matter how we worship, but God doesn't. Um, so let's go back to Genesis. Do you remember why, why God accepted Abel's offering, but not Cain's? It was because God has a standard for worship. Cain fell short, but Abel didn't. God accepted one way of worship and rejected the other. Or think about the directions that God gave Moses on the construction of the tabernacle. Everything was to, everything was to be built, Exodus 25.40 says, according to the pattern on the mount. Nothing could be changed. Nothing. God wanted the tabernacle to be nothing more and nothing less what he told Moses. Anything other than what God described would be strange fire. And we can also remember Christ speaking with a Samaritan woman. Remember when he's having this conversation with her and he's, he says, An hour is coming and now is when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For such people the Father seeks to be his worshipers. John 4.23 God will only accept a certain type of worship from his creatures. It can't be our own invention. It must be according to his word. Anything less, God will not accept. When we worship the Lord, on, on Sunday when we worship possibly with our family, or any, any other time, let's remember that God only accepts worship that's according to his word. Nothing more, nothing less will do. Then we have affection. We glorify God with our affections. This is our love for God, and it should be intense. Deuteronomy 6, 5. You all know this verse. And you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your might. This is a command, not a suggestion. God commands us to love him. It's our duty, but it should also be our delight because he is commanding us to love him. This is not, this is not God, loving God merely for what he does for us, but for loving, loving him for who he is. Let him take away all that he has given us as he did with Job. And we can still say, as Job did, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Let goods and kindred go, this mortal life also. We still have God, and ultimately, that is all that matters. Our love for him is greater than anything we have. It's greater than our spouses. It's greater than our children. It's greater than our parents. It's greater than any earthly possession. That's the love that God calls us to. That's, that's the love that God expects from us. It doesn't mean we don't love our family, our spouses, but it means that our love for Christ needs to be that great. Remember Paul. The love of Christ for Paul and Paul's love for Christ compelled Paul to lose his life for Christ's sake and the gospel. <coughs> Thank you.
Loving God is glorifying God. And lastly is subjection. By this, Watson means a life that is dedicated to God in service. He points out that the angels in heaven are always ready to serve God with great quickness. They don't hesitate. They stand and they are eagerly waiting for a command. Listen to Psalm 103.20. Bless the Lord, you his angels, mighty in strength who perform his word, obeying the voice of his word. Do you ever think what motivates the angels to obey? They're, they're not robots. They, they do have choice. They do have the ability to choose. What motivates them to obey? Why are they so eager to subject themselves to God's will? Now, I was thinking about this, and uh, perhaps I'm wrong, but I, I think that um, they remember what happened to their peers that disobeyed and the great and terrible judgment that fell upon them. I think I can say that angels are motiva- motivated by a great fear of God, greater than you and I may ever ha- have in this life, possibly. I mean, think about it. They're, they're standing, they're in the presence of God. You know, we, 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 we walk by faith, but they, they walk by sight. They're in heaven. Okay? But I also think that the angels are motivated to subject themselves to God because serving God brings them satisfaction maybe even joy. We know that Satan had a strong desire to be God, right? He was an angel. He was the anointed cherub who covers. He was like the greatest angel, the greatest created being. And he had desires to be God. And you remember remember Legion? When Legion confronted Christ, or tried to confront Christ, or whatever was going on there, he was afraid. Please don't send me into the abyss, he said to Christ. Send me into that herd of swine. Why? Because he was afraid. He didn't want to get cast into the abyss. Or they. It's a different pronoun. <laughs> um, so, I think we can surmise from this um, the idea of subjection that angels do have emotions so it would fall that they do take delight in obedience. I think they do. And they take terror at the thought of disobedience. And we also know that angels in heaven, they sing praises to God. And some, like the, living, the four living creatures, never cease to sing praises to God. So the, the, the whole point that I'm trying to make is, and I think Watson makes, is that there's, they, they obey God because they delight in obeying his word. Okay? And I can attest to this fact, too. And I'll just end this part by saying, when I subject myself to God for service, it brings me the, the most joy. Sure, I get, I get great joy when I think about the Lord. I get great joy when I meditate on His Word. I get great joy when I, I, I meet with the saints on Sunday. It brings me great joy. But I think that the most joy comes when I serve Christ. When I'm using the gifts that he's given me. And I, and I think that you guys can attest to that too. That when we're serving Christ, it's going to bring us, it, it can bring us the greatest joy in our lives. Watson says, a good Christian is like the sun, which not only sends forth heat, but also goes its circuit around the world. He who glorifies God has not only his affections heart heated with love to God but he goes his circuit too he moves vigorously in the sphere of obedience we glorify God when we are devoted to his service so that's what glorifying God looks like on our part <clears throat> it involves appreciation adoration or worship affection and subjection <clears throat> now we're going to get into some practical application now. How can we glorify God? How can we do it? What are some ways that we can do it right now, okay? Watson gives like 17 different examples, and we're not going to look at all of them. We don't have time for that. 
But we're going to look at a few of them. I'm going to I picked a handful out that I thought would be helpful, and um, I'm just going to go through these with you. We glorify. Here's the first one. We glorify God when we aim at it. Okay. <clears throat> it can't happen by chance. It needs to be intentional and aimed for. Now this is deer hunting country. Do you know anyone who ever killed a deer without aiming at it? Maybe in your car. <laughs> but what about in the woods when you have your rifle? Did you ever kill a deer without aiming at it? Pulling the trigger? No. Okay? And we can't expect to aim, to, to hit God's glory if we don't aim at it. And the truth is, th this, is, this, is, this, is the, th this idea is so big, it's, Paul says, you know, it's almost in passing, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Like the purpose to life was obviously not to sin. The purpose of all of our lives is to give glory to God in everything that we do. But instead, we miss the mark every time we sin. But the point is that Watson makes is, if you want to give glory to God, you've got to aim at it. It's not just going to happen. It, it needs to be our aim. It needs to be, God bless you. We glorify, so, so we must aim at God's glory if we want uh, if, if it needs to be aimed at if we want to hit it. The next thing is if we glorify God by an honest and simple confession of sin. Confession of sin to God means we agree with God. We come to him with no excuses. Confession should be freely made. It should be without any coercion. Confess, con <coughs> excuse me, confess your sin like the tax collector, not like the Pharisee. One went home justified, the other didn't. One was completely honest with, with, uh, with God and hid nothing. The other pretended and lied to God. He who conceals his sins will not prosper, but he who confesses and forsakes them will find mercy, it says in Proverbs. God is glorified when we confess our sins to him. It proves that he is right and just, and his word is true. Next, we glorify God by believing. By believing. Romans 4.20 says, Abraham was strong in faith, giving glory to God. Believing God shows that he is worthy of our trust. He's a trustworthy God and will stand by his promises to us. Watson says that faith knows there are no impossibilities with God and will trust him where it cannot trace him. Next, we glorify God by being fruitful. <clears throat> it's God's desire for us that we bear much fruit. All of God's creation bears fruit, doesn't it? Just look outside. How can we think that we are exempt from this? We are also God's creation. And moreover, we are new creatures in Christ Jesus, created for good works, that we should walk in them. Paul tells the Philippians that they have been filled with the fruit of righteousness which comes through Jesus Christ to the praise, to the glory and praise of God. We glorify God by bearing much fruit. Next, we glorify God by being contented in that state in which providence has placed us. It's easy to glorify God when things are going well, right? When we have plenty, it's easy to give thanks to God. Not so when things are bad. When providence takes away our safety, our security, when he reduces our comforts, what do we do? Watson says, for one to be content when he is in heaven is no wonder. But to be content under the cross is a Christian. Is, is like a Christian. As believers, we must know that whatever happens to us not, not only doesn't escape God's notice, but more, he has provided it. Okay, That's the providence of God. Remember Naomi when she said, don't call me Mara, or don't call me Naomi, which means pleasant. Call me Mara, which means bitter. 
because the Lord has dealt bitterly with me. Now, it might sound like she was complaining there, but she was just saying, the Lord, this is the lot God gave me. He gave me, a, he gave me bitter, or bitter uh, things to eat. And, um, but she recognized that it was God. She didn't say, oh, I had, a, I had bad luck. You know, what do we say today? That's not what the saints of old used to say. That's not what the saints in the scripture said. They attributed everything to God, to God's providence. They didn't always understand it, but, you know, like Job, well, I don't understand, but though he slay me, I, I trust him. Next, we glorify God by standing up for the truth. Jude 3 speaks of contending earnestly for the truth. Proverbs says, buy the truth and sell it not. The truth is a precious jewel that God has entrusted to us. We dare not let it go, nor sell it off. Our general demeanor as believers is, is to be at peace with all men, as far as it depends on us. But in regard to truth, Jude says, contend for it, fight for it. Don't give it, don't give, don't give it up no matter what. We glorify God by standing up for the truth. Next, we glorify God by praising him. Psalm 86, 12 says, I will give thanks to you, O Lord, with all my heart, and I will glorify your name forever. When we sing to the Lord, we exalt him before all men. As we, men as we mentioned before, this doesn't add anything to God's intrinsic glory. But praising his name does lift God up in the esteem of others. And let us, let, let's do this when we're at home, when we're at church, wherever we are. There's so many things to sing praises to the Lord about. We glorify God when we praise his name. And lastly, we glorify God when we have an eye to, to God in all our natural and civil actions. Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians 10.31, whether, whether then you eat or drink, or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. That pretty much sums it up right there. Nothing is excluded from this statement. Everything that we do is to be done in a way that glorifies God. Even the mundane things like eating and drinking? Yes, even those mundane things like eating and drinking. But are they really mundane if we're supposed to be doing them to the glory of God? Are they really insignificant? We are, Paul also tells us to redeem the time, which means buy it back, reshape it, reuse it for a higher and nobler purpose. It's like going to the market and finding something that is like beaten up and like buying an antique or something and, and fixing it up so it can be used again for something else. Well, buy back the time, our art, Whatever we're doing, it, it, nothing is insignificant. It, it, can, it should all be done to the glory of God. There's, there's no insignificant thing that we do. It, it all needs to be redeemed. So, this, this includes whatever work we do, whether we are, as Joe Boot likes to say, a butcher, a baker, or a candlestick maker. Okay? It doesn't matter what we do. We, we need to live in a way that glorifies God. And this, this means, you know, as far as business is concerned, if we have a business, it means having honest scales. You know, don't put your thumb on the scale. <laughs> Watson says, do to others as we would have them do to us, so that when we sell our commodities, we don't sell our consciences also. So that concludes our, our discussion about glorifying God. And just for the last part, we're going to look, and we're, we're going to be done very shortly. Uh, but the last part is, is the enjoyment of God. So going back to the original question, what is the chief end of man? The chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. Now, the, the question is, implies that there's one end, not two. It's the chief end. It's not the chief ends, okay? So, in other words, glorifying God and enjoying Him forever 
are not contradictory purposes, they're not contradictory ends. Does this mean that we don't glorify God if we don't enjoy Him? Is that what that means? It does. It does mean that. Watson says when, pe- when God's people hang their heads, it looks as if they don't serve a good master or repented of their choice, which reflects dishonor on God. Your serving him does not glorify him unless it's done with gladness. It's as much our duty to enjoy God as it is to glorify God. I only need to remind you of the first and great commandment again, which is you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul, with all your mind and strength. This is the great and foremost commandment, but there, here's just a few others. Psalm 100, verse 2, Serve the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful singing. I, I, I honestly, I think we've lost, the, the church has lost singing. I do. We, we all, I, I, I think singing should be like such a big part of our lives. It really should. It, it should, it should, it should, I mean, we, we should be so joyful. We should be singing, like, all the time. When I know when I first got saved, I, I couldn't, I, I had all, you know, I, I grew up in the church, and I grew up hearing all the old hymns, and I, I suffered through that because I, I wasn't a Christian at the time. But after I got converted, they all came back to me, and I just was like, I just remembered them all. They all came back to me like a flood. And it was, and I just remember. How do I remember this? These hymns, but I, it just—it was like, man, what else? What else is there to do but praise the Lord? You know. So anyway, and I had a lot of time because I was at college. But, um, but the point that the point that Watson's making is that God is to be enjoyed. Listen to this. Listen to this in Deuteronomy twenty-eight forty-seven to forty-eight. Because you did not serve the Lord with joy and a glad heart for the abundance of all things, therefore you shall serve your enemies whom the Lord will send against you. Wow. That comes with a warning. This is pretty serious stuff. And think about this. How wretched are we that God must command us to enjoy him? As great and as wonderful as he is, like we need to be told to to enjoy him that's how wretched we are apart from Christ this is not optional but I want to encourage you though I'm speaking in this way to take seriously the work of delighting yourself in the Lord take seriously growing in your affections for Christ God does not just want our obedience he wants our hearts God does not call us to live our lives without emotion, without affection, without joy. I believe that one reason we struggle to enjoy God is because we aren't looking to Him beyond the means of grace that we, that we have. When we come to read the Scriptures, do we look to them for life? Or do we look for Christ? I'm not saying that God's word is irrelevant, but it's pointing to Christ. That's what Christ said. He said, you search the scriptures because you think that it is in them that you have life. But it is these, Christ said, that testify of me. When we worship on the Lord's day, do we come only to meet with the saints or do we come to meet with God's, with, with God? Coming before his presence. That's the enjoyment of God. It's in this life. When we pray, are we merely doing our duty or are we repeating meaningless words? I'm sorry. We're we're either we're either repeating we're either just going through emotions, repeating meaningless words, or we're pouring out our heart to God. We are 
pouring out our heart to God and we're, we're longing to have the light of his countenance. So David talks about that in the Psalms. Now, I'm, the, I'm not going Henry Blackaby on you. I'm, I'm talking about this is what the scriptures speak about um, enjoying God. Okay? This is what it means to enjoy God. Yes, he has given us his word. He's given us worship on Sunday. He's given us prayer. But all these things are to bring us to an enjoyment of him. Okay? When we get to heaven, guess what? We're going to be in God's presence. We're not going to ha- say, what, what does Jesus look like? Let me read that Bible verse again. He's going to be right over here. And we can look at him. Our faith will be sight. Our hope will be realized. Our love will be face to face. If our concept of heaven doesn't include um, being with Christ, I think maybe we need to think about that examine ourselves heaven is a longing to be with Christ if if we long for him if we long for Christ then that's that's what heaven is all about it's not about going there to to just to escape this life or 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 going to 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 have an you know everlasting um, football or something like that Watson stresses that it's wonderful to have the ordinances of God, but to have the God of the ordinances is better. And I I do believe that God God does grace us with his presence when we come to him the right way. And we'll know it because he fills our hearts with joy. We'll know it because our hearts will burn with with love um, for Christ within us. And, and just, just to close, um, thank you for bearing with me. Um, I know this has been a, a challenging topic, but I, I think it's, it's also been very exciting to me to, to study. Um, the, the enjoyment of God is, is not just for this life. The best part is the life to come. We are to enjoy God forever, not only in this life, but also in the life to come. Consider with me what Paul says in Ephesians 2, 7. When when speaking of our union with Christ, he says, so that in the ages to come, he might show us the surpassing riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. In other words, the process of glorifying God and enjoying him forever is an ongoing, everlasting process between us and the triune God. Think of how great it will be in heaven. If we are satisfied now with God, we will be even more satisfied in heaven because it will be an ever-increasing process because God will give us a greater capacity to enjoy Him, a greater capacity to glorify Him. It will be just like John Newton wrote, when we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. So the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy him forever. 